Good morning. My name is Dawn Braswell and I'm with Siemens Energy and I'm also the chair of the Aerospace Advanced Manufacturing and Security Industry Innovation Council. I've asked them for a year to shorten that for me and they've not done it yet. So that's, that's the name of the council. We are so excited to have you all with us today. This is our largest turnout ever and we appreciate that. So that's the good news. Pam's my manager, so Pam, the bad news is I probably won't ask us to do this again real soon. Okay, so just so you know, your budget's gonna get hit again. Um, we are very excited that you're here and I wanna welcome some people. If I could have a show of hands as to how many council members we have present. Who are our council members? Okay. What about first time visitors with us? Wow. Okay, welcome. We encourage you to come back to our next meeting. Our panel today is made up of Pam House with Siemens Energy and Andreas Turner from Bloom and Bill Taylor. He is from the National Academy Foundation and then Julie Ammons and she is from Caterpillar. And so first, I'm going to uh, go through a series of questions and then we're gonna turn it over to the audience so you guys can ask as they talk about apprenticeship and work-based <coughs> learning experiences. So Pam, I'm gonna start with you. Could you describe some of the work-based learning experiences you're providing to students here at Siemens? Well, we're doing a variety of things. Uh, we're, we're most famous probably for our apprenticeship program, which uh, fortunately with the help of our partners, we were able to start very quickly two years ago so we have 12 young people, all 18 year olds, who are in a formal apprenticeship training program here. Uh, we also um, <coughs> offer a summer internship. So we take about 12 kids every summer for a six week, uh, 40 hour a week program to learn all about advanced manufacturing and we rotate them through the facility. Uh, we most recently started a maintenance apprenticeship training program. We recruited military veterans and we will actually be um, interviewing some more of those people tomorrow to fill an additional apprenticeship slot. So we, we always have our hand in something. We've started an energy academy through the National Academy Foundation at Olympic High School as a feeder system uh, into Siemens, uh, Duke Energy, Areva, Piedmont Natural Gas, all the energy companies in Charlotte serve on the advisory board there. So we're actually stacking uh, <coughs> credentials for the students as juniors and seniors to learn um, energy related jobs and earn a certificate through Central Piedmont Community College so that the day they graduate their credential to go straight to work if they choose to do so. Right. Andreas, can you tell us about some of the work-based learning experiences for your students? Well, I mean, it's basically the same. I just heard here we start with them very young, we recruit them out of high school and in this case we are juniors what we do, we go to schools, tell them about what is the apprenticeship 2000, and it's a consortium of eight companies. We all do different things, but we have the same need. We need the technicians. And we just explain this very short, because in 16 year old kids, what can you tell them? And in five minutes, you lost them all. <laughs> yeah, based on that, we invite them to an open house, and the key there is that they come with one of their parents at least to this open house and see what is manufacturing now. So it's high tech, it's not dirty, not noisy anymore. <coughs> the moment you get the parents in, they see that you have a supporter. And then we also explain what we do, what is the apprenticeship 2000. And in this case, 8,000 hours, 1,700 hours of that is spent at the local community college, in our case, it's in Charlotte, CPCC. They have to go for a mechatronic curriculum that we help to develop. And I've seen some people from CDC here, so thank you for this work they did there over the years. Yeah, we start out then very simple. We get them back, the kids who want to come back for an orientation. Four evenings, they come to two companies and they check out, is this something I would like to do? We want hands-on people. We show them really what we do. And again, it's done in these different companies. Always two companies together. Two days here, two days there. At the end, the students make a decision, you like it or not. Next step is then an internship. Pam talked about it, it's a paid internship, six weeks. It gives the students, but also the companies a great opportunity and chance now to evaluate the students. And after that, it's a competition. Some really want to go on and want to be in an apprenticeship, and some say, thank you for doing that. I would like to do something else, and that's fine with us. And then the apprenticeship starts. We are, the first year is spent half a day in 
these companies because in the morning hours they finish the senior year. So it's only in the afternoon, and the second year you become a full-time student there. And this goes on and on where we send them once a week for one day, one evening to CPCC, and the rest is done at the company. We have trainers, mentors, on-the-job training sometimes, and when it gets very technically, you need to have the supervision, so we're very proud of that we have never had really bad accident. So you have to watch that, but you can develop your workforce with the system. It's nothing new, it's around since hundreds of years. And uh, it's just, in this country, vocational training is just not a word that people want to hear. So when you want to know more about it, go to our website, apprenticeship2000.com, and you see all the links to these companies. You see a lot of the overview. We started back in 1995, so it's nothing new. And I know in uh, I work for Blooming, we really changed completely the whole workforce around. I have to say that we have the average age of our key technicians is below 30 years. So this alone, these are numbers, uh, they are unheard, I would say, in, in, in the industry. So check it out. When you have questions, send some emails. I can help and answer them when I have a little time. So be patient with me. There's a lot of requests <coughs> lately that come in, as you probably know. Thank you. Thank you. Phil, do you have anything you want to add about work-based learning? I just think it's critical. It's, uh, I'll, I'll speak quickly about it, um, but at the National Academy Foundation, obviously our work is national, but it's, it's very local here. Um, before I talk about the how of what we do, I'll, I'll mention the who we do it with. I think it's critically important. It takes a partnership um, to put these kinds of opportunities uh, that Pam and Andreas have talked about in front of young people, and we're proud at NAP uh, to be partnering with the North Carolina New Schools effort, uh, along with the State Department of Instruction, and uh, here locally in Charlotte with Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Schools. So it really is an all-hands-on-deck approach and a partnership that really, at the end of the day, it's about preparing students while they're in high school to leave high school, both college and career ready. So at NAF, we're about the and in college and career ready. Um, and it's really about exposing kids to, uh, through a series of work-based learning opportunities, beginning in the ninth grade, culminating um, the graduating senior year. It's a whole range of opportunities that students have um, to really build awareness, right? How many students are, are even, I mean, I'm still blown away. I'm speechless almost in terms of what I just saw um, at shop floor. That is, you know, I think a lot of us are still holding on uh, old notions of what manufacturing is all about. So I, I get it now, the advanced, in advanced manufacturing. So building awareness for young people to even understand, um, you know, that landscape. And then begin to explore it, in a, not, not in an abstract way, not in a rote learning way, but side by side with real professionals, right? And then that. Um, builds to the next part, which is around preparation. So the entire academy model is built on combining, you know, your core academic learning with that kind of experiential work, real work-based uh, professional learning. Julie, do you want to talk a little bit about Caterpillar Apprenticeship Program? Sure. Um, we are new in the program, and like the seniors here that have a lot more experience, um, we d we began last fall, but of course the work began long before that, and I agree that the key instrument is the partnership. We have a very strong partnership with the North Carolina Department of Labor, our local community college, which is CCCC, <laughs> so that's a mouthful, and our high school. And um, unlike the other program, we actually have the students fill an application out. It's a very lengthy application, so they have to really want to do this. They have to have four recommendations, two of those from their CTE teachers and two from outside. Uh, the committee of the group, the North Carolina Department of Labor, Caterpillar, uh, CCCC, and the Lee County High School will then review those applicants. And we actually have an interview, and in that interview process, we bring in a parent, so they have to have a parent. Uh, and then from there, we do a matrix and score them, or the college likes to call it a Rubik's. Um, at that point, then we take those students, and they enroll in the, the fall year. And they're juniors in the fall. Uh, we've uh, had some challenges in doing that because the Department of Labor requires the 16 year of age. Uh, we have managed to find ways to work around that, so we haven't turned students away because they're not 16 in the fall, but we have found um, ways to work with that process. So they go and work, or go to the college to take the classes specific for Caterpillar. We had some funding, grant money that we put together 
to develop some programs for the welding in our Sanford facility and associated with our new facility building uh, fabrications. Uh, we just quickly took those classes and embedded them in what we wanted the students to learn in their first 90 minute block. They're learning specific information about Caterpillar, or specific training. They're being paid by Caterpillar while they're in that specific training. And then the summer, they will come and work at our facility up to 32 hours. Then they'll go back in the uh, senior year and they'll have two blocks, their first two blocks on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They'll continue specific training um, that we have designed for them. And some of that soft skills. We find these students need some help in their soft skills. So we're going to do the soft skill training. Uh, while they're doing the training, they're being paid. And when we uh, get all the training done, then they'll come to this um, facility and work during their senior year. To work for Caterpillar, though, they have to be 18. Uh, some of the students will not be 18 when they graduate. So we will continue to let them work part-time until they have the opportunity to be 18. While they're in our program, though, they'll be um, getting career college credits. They're getting their diploma. They're getting welding certificates. Um, and they're getting the skills to make them a highly qualified candidate for Caterpillar at a full-time position. Okay, great. Thank you. Julie's already segue into my next question as to some of the challenges. You mentioned their age as, as well as the soft skills. Andreas, what are some other challenges that you've encountered working with this population and how have you worked through those for solutions? Well, the biggest challenge, I think, and uh, I don't know, is Caterpillar doing this alone? Um, at this time we are, but we have gone out in the community and encouraged because we're right now taking 15 each time. Mm -hmm. um, we are in ramp up situations, so we haven't completely um, uplifted our uh, facility. And we will soon do that probably in the next year, but already have plans for expansion. But at one point, we're not going to be able to take 15 students every year because if you think about the commitment, it's really 30. Yeah. Because you have 15 in their junior year and you have 15 in their senior year. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge commitment, and at one time we will have to share that. Now, we've had three other companies in the area that said they'll take anyone that we don't want. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we have seen the same thing. The reason for the apprenticeship partnership was that numbers make it work, okay? When you send five students to a local community college, what will they do for you? Yeah. So that's a big challenge. So we started early on partnering up with companies and local companies some foreign companies, they, they knew about the apprenticeship program, so it was not a problem for us to do that. In the beginning, I think there was a minimum requirement of eight students per class. Yes. Now it's 12. So you have to bring at least 12 to 15 every year that this goes on. With eight companies, we are doing this. We're in a 15 to 20 range constantly now. So we are set, we are good for the future. This recruiting itself is a challenge. We are not here to tell children or parents that college is bad, and this is good. We will never do that. What we promote is engineering. And I want kids to make a decision. Do you like to work with your hands? Try it out. When you have done this, and uh, you, know, you do a lot of things at home and work on things, you're probably fit for our company. The problem is now that even an associate's degree in mechatronics is so difficult. There are physics, statics, math classes. When you're not good in math, you will not survive an associate's mm -hmm. degree. So you need very smart kids, but you also need the kids who just wouldn't rather go to a handsome program than to a college. And I always also say in this uh, presentation at the open house, for me, an apprenticeship is the start. When you like what you do, stay there. When you want to go on, continue your education. And I know lots of people that went all the way up. Our CEO, for example, I know other companies, the same thing. These people know every single thing in this company. They have been everywhere. So when you want to do more, do more. So it's, it's, there are challenges, I think. Again, the numbers make it work better. When you have a good partnership with community colleges, they will listen. And we have uh, advice report functions. When you look at CPCC here in Charlotte, I recommend everyone to go there. The equipment changed dramatically in the last seven, eight years. It's all state of the art now. And it's a lot of money that was spent there. The benefit is anyone who goes to this college gets something out of it. See? So I think these are the challenges that the school, school number one for me. 
Pam, what skills do you look for in students as they enter the apprenticeship program and what skills do you see in these students when, at the end of their experience? Well, I first start looking at, you know, GPA, grades, what classes they've taken, but a huge thing for me is attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a lot of kids who beg to get into the program, but if they miss 13 days of their junior year, I'm not interested. Um, and so, you know, we, we try to tell these kids early on attendance is really important, and when it's time for the rubber to meet the road, if they've not had good attendance, it's going to cost them an opportunity, because I don't think you'd take them either, would you, Andreas? Nope. So, uh, and then we put them through, when Andreas talks about our screening process, it's amazing to me to watch the kids that start on Tuesday, and by Friday, you know who's going to make it and who's not going to make it based on their math skills, based on their mechanical aptitude, uh, based on their ability to read a drawing. I mean, you, you know by Friday night before they take that final test, mm -hmm. you pretty, pretty much know who's gonna make it through the process and who's not gonna make it through the process. So basically once they've done all that, they then have to go take the Accuplacer test at CPCC. And some of them at that point won't score high enough to take college level work. So by the time they've gone through all of that series of testing and hands-on and Accuplacer, you know you've got some really, really good kids to choose from. Okay. Julie, anything as far as skills that you guys are looking for on, on the front end, and then what have you seen as a result of, being, of participating in the apprenticeship program? Well, in the rubrics, we do look for CTE credits. Um, it, it identifies if they are going to be that hands-on skills type person. Uh, we're not really focused on the GPA from the school, although it helps uh, identify issues, but we do look at attendance, and that is huge. Mm -hmm. um, attendance, attitude, and uh, uh, the desire. They have to have the desire and some kind of mechanical aptitude, and that's where you get that CTE that helps right. you understand if they're going to have a mechanical aptitude or not. So they have to have that to even get into our program. And once they're in the program, again, they're in their um, junior year and they're going to school, you'll quickly find that those don't want to come to school, won't be in our program. Mm -hmm. uh, we began 17 last year and have lost four. So we're not playing around. You mm -hmm. must meet the requirements of the GPA of the 3.0 with the college, and you need to be there. You've got to be in class. So those students have been sent back, back to the high school, and they're not in the program. Okay. Bill, what benefits and challenges do you see companies experiencing in offering opportunities like this for students? Well, I think uh, in terms of benefits, uh, the, the first is probably the most obvious, right? I mean, it's, it's really an opportunity for companies to get involved uh, very early on in the young person's development. And, and you're hearing great examples of how that's being done. And, and it really um, it helps in a very profound way, and in many cases it's life altering, right? You're changing literally the trajectory that a young person is on. And, and some of the kids who are struggling the greatest in high school because they're asking the question I know I asked when I was in high school, which is, why am I here? Why do I need to know this stuff? I know you're saying it's important, but I don't understand why, right? So I think what you're hearing is that uh, companies can play a key role in helping to bring that relevancy to bear, mm -hmm. um, and they benefit from that. Right? Because you are, as I said, you're, you're engaged with your future workforce. And I think w some of the research that we've seen, that we know, um, is true, that it improves em employee morale. Uh, employees like, and I, can, I know just from seeing that shop floor, if, you know, the, the, looking on the, at the faces of employ uh, the employees as we were taking our tour, they're proud of the fact that people <laughs> want to come into our facility mm -hmm. and learn about uh, what it is that we do, and they have an opportunity to impart uh, the expectations and the skill sets that they're looking for to bring the next generation in. And it, it improves morale. It makes it a, a great place to work for, knowing that their company cares about um, their workforce. It, and uh, for a company, obviously, brand is important, right? And generating the positive value you know, of a brand um, is enhanced when uh, it's known uh, both internally and externally that this is a company that's very serious about uh, you know, contributing not only to its own workforce, but lifting up um, the entire workforce uh, of, the of the country. And uh, I think it really exposes and it helps to in increase diversity, you know, particularly as we're partnering with mm -hmm. urban schools. You know, a lot of companies care deeply right now. If we look at current workforce trends and where we are, there's real, we're leaving large segments of our population on the sidelines. And, and companies realize that that's, that's not helpful to them, it's not helpful to the economy. Um, so they, they get the big picture. So a lot 
of uh, direct benefits involved in, in partnering and in doing this work. But there are real challenges, and I think, I think both uh, Julie and Andreas and Pam, if I've already, I, I don't think I'd go further in, in terms of echoing um, the, the, the very real uh, policy, you know, mm -hmm. there, there are real issues around, you know, either labor laws, um, age requirements, um, but what I would say, so, so there are real challenges, but, but what I will say about that is they're all navigable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Exactly. And, and I think, again, through partnership and commitment, I think if we're starting early enough around managing expectations, right, and helping expose young people to make sure that they're prepared, right, for these kinds of opportunities, we start that earlier in the process, because I think one of the challenges, and I, and I say this to a lot of my educator friends, uh, you know, we, we kind of wait too late. Uh, in that process, you know, we think, well, let's save that opportunity. Let's start talking to kids once they're juniors and seniors. Mm -hmm. Way too late for that. Mm -hmm. um, we have to embed those foundational skills much earlier on. So I think, you know, I think it, if we address those kinds of challenges early, mm -hmm. um, we remove a lot of barriers late. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Andreas and Julie, I'm going to pose this question to you guys. Um, if you could give teachers one tip for preparing students for work-based learning, what, what tip would you, would you give um, teachers today, Andreas? Pay attention to what the teacher says. <laughs> <laughs> no, for me, it's, uh, as an engineer, math is just a thing. So I love mathematics teachers, and I know how hard this is to teach. And you know, it took me years later to understand why I needed mm -hmm. what they taught me when I was young. And for me, a way to show young kids is with, like Bill just said, you have to go in middle schools. Start mm -hmm. with Lego robotics. Teach them something that they can play with. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this makes way more sense for them. So it's, it's, it's not so difficult to do, I think. And, but there are some uh, things we will start, or some started already in school. So it's, it's for me, the whole feeder system way earlier. We come so late into this game, it's very challenging. Julie, what about you? What tips do you have for teachers in the school system preparing students to come to a place like Caterpillar? That's really a tough one because I would almost say it's the parents, not the teachers. Ah, okay, good point. Um, but, you know, we can train them. We can, if you want, we can train you. So it's more the attitude. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, a lot of young people have <laughs> bad attitudes. Uh, it's not going to get them far in life. So I think it starts at home. Okay. It starts there, and then the teachers just need to be able to foster a good environment that encourages the learning, the willingness, uh, and not every student is going to be a 4.0. And I don't want the 4.0s. They're going to college. I don't think they're going to be happy. Uh, they won't probably be successful as a welder. Uh, so those people that we're looking for are those that need that opportunity for the rest of their career and their life. Okay. And, and I think, too, if I can comment, helping teachers teach in context. Yeah. So we've been in, in really involved in the, I, I roped Andreas in this year um, into a project <coughs> we've labeled Stimmersion. We did a two-week teacher rotation through industry last summer, and the teachers were, it was profound for them. Uh, one of the math teachers, he's on YouTube, if you go look up Stimmersion, he said, who knew you used right angle trigonometry in welding? He said, so now when I have that kid who says, when am I going to use this in real life? I can say at Siemens, if you're a welder, you're going to use trigonometry. So, you know, giving, giving them good context to teach in. Yeah, that's so powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to talk about this summer, what we're going to be doing, what we're part of as far as the rotation, how many companies? Yeah, we start? actually, uh, last summer we rotated 23 teachers through eight companies, and this year we got real ambitious and uh, brought in some other companies like Bloom, and we're going to rotate 50 teachers uh, through a two-week rotation this summer. So we actually had a meeting on um, Friday to say who's going to what place on what day. So it's going to be, it's, you know, we all have regular day jobs too, so it's, uh, it's getting interesting and dicey, but we felt like it was such a powerful experience for the teachers that we have to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, the Center for International Understanding attended our meeting on Friday, and they are interested in taking that model and pushing it out statewide um, and working with, with all the counties in North Carolina to try to get 
some kind of teacher uh, education in, in, in the industrial setting started. So we actually, um, this year we're doing advanced manufacturing, but we're also doing a rotation in healthcare um, and IT. So we're trying to give the teachers a lot of different experience to see that there are really jobs out there that require different kinds of thinking, not necessarily all a four-year liberal arts degree. All right, um, and my last question before we um, take questions from the audience is, you know, if we have companies here who are not participating in an apprenticeship program, something of that nature, what, what would your advice be to them and what are, you know, if you could give them one word of advice, what would that be, Pam? Well, I think it's, uh, we just had this conversation before we started today. It's not difficult to do. I mean, we, we've kind of created the model and we've shown people how to do it. Now they just have to go do it. So um, there's uh, some talk with Cleveland Community College and Gaston College. I think they got the Golden Leaf money, right? Um, they're actually going to start a mechatronics apprenticeship program at Cleveland, but they're going to start a chemical technician program at Gaston. They're going to share resources. So. You know, this is not hard to do. You, you have people who know how to do it. Just go find those people and get them to help you. Mm -hmm. I think the shortage of, of technicians is well known. Mm -hmm. When you look at the average age of the key people that these companies have, it's way above 50 years. So when you want to be in business, fix it. You cannot wait for anyone to fix it. Do it on your own. And we have started years back, and now we get more and more companies who will do the same thing. It's hard work, yes, but yeah, it works. It's rewarding too. Yeah, very yeah good. Bill, what would you say? I, I'd say it's not as scary as it sounds or it seems. <laughs> uh, how many of you have your own teenagers at home? Anybody in the room? Yeah. Right. And, and when's the last time you've been into a high school? Right. So I think part of the challenge here is we, we have to let go of some of our own, you know, help, you know, conceptions about teenagers, what they're capable of, and what our own high school experiences were, because today is vastly different. Um, and you play a critical role in helping to shape that opportunity. Um, and uh, I, th I think you heard some great examples today of how you can impact not only students, but the lives of teachers and the educators who are working with them day to day. Uh, and to get where we're trying to go collectively, uh, in terms of our companies and as a country, we need all hands on deck. Um, so I really encourage you to get involved. Julie? For manufacturing to strive in the United States, we need to wake up. Mm -hmm. And to wake up, I would say, if you're running a business and you're not thinking outside the box, mm -hmm. you may not be in business because you're going to not have that skill set to fulfill your needs. Yep. How do you get it? What do you do to go get it? I've done other things as well, just trying to find different ways to fill that need. I'm in Sanford, North Carolina in Lee County, not a big county. So um, I'm drawing from every county outside. Mm -hmm. But the concept of thinking that manufacturing is dirty, it's not rewarding, it's not what I want my child to do. Uh, we need to get into the schools and change the teacher's mindset so that they're not teaching that manufacturing's bad. We need to get the community involved. And if you're a business owner, you need to figure it out. And, and where I'm at, all somebody would have to say to the high school is, I'm thinking about an apprenticeship, and it'd be like a swarm of people all over them to help them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't do it by myself at all. I had more help than I really needed, so we had to focus in on a very unique team to do that. Mm -hmm. But they're willing. The educators want to help. They want to succeed. They want to see each child have some kind of opportunity because those that aren't going to college don't know what they're going to do. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, at this time we'll take any questions that you may have for the panel. Any questions? Uh, yes. I'd like to ask one, and the small business first. Uh, there are a world of small businesses involved in advanced manufacturing. Have you been able to integrate small businesses into your programs? And I'm, I'm going to small businesses. I'm going to repeat that question to make sure they get it. You know, Barry's asking, have you been able to incorporate small business into the program? So go ahead. Yes, we did, and I think in Meritech, when they started, had less than 10 people. It's one of our biggest success stories, because he was able to really grow his business with the people that he trained, and it's been amazing. But work. he does it one or two one at a time, you know what I mean? So, so all of our kids start as a cohort, yeah. and the good news is I, I, I gave them six. 
And so then Bloom has a couple, FAF has a couple, Ameritech has a couple, so they're actually able to schedule their classes for that cohort group. So it, it, it really works for everyone. Small, big, when you're bigger, you need a training facility. When you're smaller, you do it with a hands-on mentorship training program. It doesn't cost you so much. So this model is working regardless, it works. I mean, mm -hmm. You just have to find the best technician in your company. Is he willing to give his knowledge on? At the beginning, you will get a lot, lot of resistance, but all of a sudden, everyone wants to give something on, and, and, and these young kids just, it's, it's the most amazing thing to see what you can do in a company. Then. I think there's a real advantage, if I could add, yeah. there's a real advantage um, in talking to small businesses all across the country. I get to do that. And, you know, the same nimbleness you have in the marketplace, it, it's the same nimbleness students uh, experience in, in working in a small company because they get to see a whole range, right, of the business operations. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to do that in a larger company. It takes a little bit more maneuvering, you know, to be able to do that. So I think there's some real advantages for students to be able to have those work-based learning opportunities in small settings. Yes. So Andreas mentioned starting early. Mm -hmm. Sometimes high schools, they've either checked in or checked out. Mm -hmm. What are you all doing at the middle school level? Uh, most of the time we hear companies say, no, nah, can't have middle school, we're doing a plan. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't get exposed to those experiences, I mean, that's where you kind of plant the seed. What are you doing there to mm -hmm. kind of break down some of those challenges and really begin to develop that, that pathway at an early age? All right, so how are you working with the middle school population? The middle school, I mean, we have one group that we support in Florida that does this since four years now. And what they did, they took the robotics, Lego robotics, and brought it back. They got donations who companies to buy these kits. And they got in the beginning, I think, some of the engineers helped teaching the teachers what to do because they didn't know anymore what to do. And this turned out to be a feeder system for them when they entered the high school. They ended up in these programs, and then when you are 16 years, you can come to plan to us. You cannot come when you're younger. It, and the HR department would just shut you down. You can't come in. It's just very difficult. But you can work around this a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you expose young children earlier, what is really going on out there? Can you show them with videos what is manufacturing now? And the one thing I like with this young generation now, they love their little electronic devices. You just go to one of our companies. We love them too. <laughs> so take advantage of it. They are really good with technology. This word mechatronic, by the way, comes from mechanical and electronic. So you want from both words something. And we just get them ready slowly from the early age on. But it's very challenging. It's a lot of work. You need to have the support from the principals in the schools. Uh, it's, in our case, when you're in, you're in. They love it. But it, it took us a while to just open these doors, I have to say. It was difficult. And we actually have a planning meeting today with um, uh, our Energy Academy at Olympic mm -hmm. High School. We're going to start a Camp Energy with our two middle feeder schools, which are Southwestern and Kennedy. Jimmy, Jimmy is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've met with those administrators at the schools, and they're, they're on board, and we've, we've offered. Uh, Siemens has really cool science energy experiment kits. And we've offered to have some of our engineers participate in that and take the kids to the school and kind of get the kids curious about energy so that when they go in the ninth grade, they have their eye on that energy academy at Olympic High School. Mm -hmm. So we, we know we got to get to the kids earlier mm -hmm. and really change the way that they think about their futures. Uh, can I just add, um, yes. I know you didn't ask me, but sorry. Mm -hmm. I know it seems simplistic, but it is encouraging. Um, unfortunately, today I'm here, but I have uh, middle school today taking a tour of our facility. So it's just something that simple mm -hmm. to get them to see early that manufacturing is not dirty. It's not mm -hmm. bad job. It's, um, and the people are happy. They think people are going to be kind of ill mm -hmm. and not so happy and dirty. They come through, and it's a very amazing um, how they change their attitude about manufacturing after the tour. Another question? Did y'all see any of our kids out there? No, mm -hmm. we didn't pass no any kids. Here. No, we didn't they pass must any. Be at school today. I think they're at school today. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would just like to thank the panel for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.